Molina Rivera's district, which would preserve 30 units of affordable rental housing. The second exemption for Red Hook Gardens property in Councilmember Carlos Menchaca's district would preserve 62 units of affordable rental property. The third, fourth, and fifth exemptions are for Manhattanville Phase 1, Unit A, Manhattanville Phase 2, Unit B, Manhattanville Phase 2, Unit C. Uh, properties located in Councilmember Mark Levine's district, and that would construct uh, 27 and 15 units, respectively, for low-income households. Uh, second, and I know there will be no questions on this today, the Council will vote on its operating budget as prepared by the City Council's <laughs> Administrative <laughs> Services Division. Uh, the budget will help the Council fulfill its mission to the people of New York City. The increases largely stem from adding staff to help the Council fulfill its mission uh, again to our constituents across the city. Uh, for example, two core functions of the Council are to legislate bills and negotiate the city's budget. To that end, adding staff and resources to the Legislative and Finance Division is critical uh, in fulfilling these functions going forward. Uh, I said I was going to do this throughout the speaker's race. I think all the candidates that were running for speaker uh, said they were going to do this. Um, and so I'm fulfilling my promise. And I am actually very excited about this. I'm, uh, I'm happy we're doing this. I think it's going to really strengthen the body. And so I'm happy to, of course, take questions on this. And, Ex explain exactly how I think it's going to strengthen the body. Um, I've also added staffing for a potential Charter Revision Commission, for a fully staffed up Oversight and Investigations Unit, and these are things, again, that I promised and that I'm committed to. The Council will also vote on a number of land use items today. The Council will vote to rezone 3510 Astoria Boulevard, located in Councilmember Costa Constantinides District, and Sea Park North, which is located in Councilmember Mark Traeger's district. Uh, in addition, we are voting to redevelop the former Spofford Juvenile Detention Center into over 700 units of affordable housing and light manufacturing space. Uh, this project is located in Land Use Committee Chair Rafael Salamanca's district. It is a big deal to turn a former detention center into a genuine place of opportunity, and I want to congratulate um, Chair Salamanca on this big victory. He's worked really hard for a long time on this. Uh, so I want to invite him up to discuss this project. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to say how excited I am today uh, about the Spofford project. I've lived in this community my entire life and uh, you know this juvenile detention center has been in my community for over 50 years. Um, it was a dark day with the violence that was occurring inside this juvenile detention center. And in 2011, the community was able to successfully close the detention center. And in 2013, as a district manager, I was working with the community to transform this big piece of land into something where the community can benefit from this. Um, and so what's exciting about this project is that I started in the very inception as a district manager in 2013 and now as a council member and the chair of the land use committee where we're giving our final stamp of approval. With this project, we'll have over 740 units of 100% affordable housing. And we're talking about units as low as $396 a month for residents in my community. Now, one of my biggest challenges and something that I am gonna work on with my community is hosting housing forums, ensuring that residents of my community know how to properly apply online and get access to these units. And most importantly, not displacing the current members of my community who stood there when this jail was standing strong. So I want to thank the land use staff. I want to thank the speaker and EDC and HPD for working together with me. And most, and most importantly, Bronx Community Board too for their vision on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also forgot to mention it's very exciting that there are units set aside for homeless individuals who need to get back into their uh, community. The council's committed to that. Uh, the council will also vote on two proposed site selections for the construction of a new 621 seat primary school and a new 572 seat primary school. I am jealous. Uh, both located in Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer's district. These schools are being constructed as part of the Hunters Point South development and will help alleviate badly overcrowded schools in his district. It is always a very big deal in our districts locally when we get one school. So to get two schools uh, in the district is really, really exciting and I want to invite him up to talk about this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for 
uh, those kind words. And indeed, this is a very good day for the families and children in District 30, and in particular in Long Island City. These two new schools, two primary schools, with an additional 1,200 seats will go a very long way towards easing the overcrowding in what is probably the fastest growing neighborhood in New York City, if not the entire country. Um, so I want to say thank you to the parents and families uh, who have fought long and hard and advocated for this. We were able to secure $230 million in the budget uh, two years ago for the building of four brand new schools. Uh, this is part of that agreement and I am thrilled that they are finally happening and construction will finally begin on one of the schools in just a couple of months. We are very excited to have this coming to our community. I would also add that since my time in the City Council, these two schools represent the 13th and 14th new school buildings wow. that will be built in my district. We have seen an enormous growth Building new schools is probably the single most important thing I can do to ease the overcrowding in District 30 and the little part of District 24 that I have as well. So this is a great victory for our community. And I just want to say to the people of Long Island City and District 30, I know that our work is not done. We need even more schools, if you can believe it. We have even more overcrowding to ease, including in the Court Square area of Long Island City. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the support of my colleagues in making sure that all of our children get the education they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Very, very exciting. Congratulations. Uh, we are also going to vote on the neighborhood rezoning for Jerome Avenue, located in council members Fernando Cabrera and Vanessa Gibson's districts. I know this has been uh, a long journey for them. They have spent an enormous amount of time and a tremendous amount of hard work has gone into this. This also includes some new schools and parks investments and the creation and preservation of affordable housing. Uh, they are gonna talk about those details. So I wanna call up council members Cabrera and Gibson in whatever order you would like. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to all of my colleagues. I am so blessed that today has finally arrived. Three years ago, uh, in 2014, when the Department of City Planning came forth with the Jerome Inwood Cromwell rezoning, we truly knew that we had a lot of work to do. We know that neighborhood rezonings tend to be very controversial because many residents feel the push out and price out effect. They feel exploited by landlords and they feel like they're going to be displaced. Many New Yorkers across our city have seen neighborhoods change all throughout our city and they are simply fed up with the level of services that they are receiving. I am so proud to have worked with my colleague, Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and all of our stakeholders, the Bronx Borough President, Bronx Community Boards 4, 5, and 7, to achieve over $189 million in the Jerome Neighborhood Rezoning Plan. I am so proud because we recognized the value of our families, our children, our seniors that lived in the Bronx when we had dark days. And now that the brighter days are ahead, we want those same families to benefit from all of the investments that we are talking about. So we have achieved two brand new 458 seat schools in school district nine and school district 10, $60 million of money to the parks department for park renovations and upgrades. And I am most proud in my district, $25.7 million for the construction of Grant Park, 4.6 million for the construction of Corporal Fisher Park, and 1.6 million for the construction of Bridge Playground. And we also have achieved $50 million in DOT infrastructure work on all of the corridors that cross over Jerome Avenue, including Burnside, Tremont, Mount Eden, 170, 167, and 161st Street. In addition, we have put aside $1.5 million in grant money for businesses that we know could potentially be displaced as a result of this rezoning. We have a commitment over the next two years to preserve 2,500 additional units of affordable housing, and that is on top of the 5,500 units of housing that has already been preserved to date from 2014 to 2017 in community
community boards four and five. And through this rezoning, we are giving money for community groups to provide anti-displacement services, a Partners in Preservation initiative, a Jobs First network, because we know local hiring and giving young people an opportunity to attain employment opportunities is truly a priority. And I am very proud that from this rezoning, we are formulating three working groups that Fernando and I will lead, a working group on public health, a working group on Southwest Bronx housing, and a working group on responsible contracting and local hiring. There is a lot more in this plan, but overall, I am so proud of the work we have done. Many said we could not do it, but we we came together like-minded people with the intention, the plan, and the purpose to get this done. And we know in the Bronx, in the West Bronx specifically, we have not had a zoning of this magnitude since the 1960s, way before I was even born. And now that I am in office, I promise and committed to my district that I will not leave office without leaving a lasting legacy behind. The schools, the parks, the access, to mass transit, the social services, and all of the programs that our residents needed yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they're going to get through this Jerome rezoning plan. So I want to thank everyone that worked with us, that walked with us on this journey. I particularly want to thank our speaker, our land use chair, Council Member Salamanca, our subcommittee on zoning chair, Council Member Moya, as well as the land use division, Raju Mann and Amy Levitan, and our phenomenal project director that got us through this, uh, Jeff Ewan, and I certainly want to recognize community boards four, five, and seven, and the Bronx Borough President. I look forward to working with my colleagues today as we put forth our vote in passing Jerome and certainly all of the work that remains after today to make sure that we hold this administration accountable for every commitment that they have made. So I thank you all. I'm so glad today is here, and I am honored to represent this beautiful district in the Bronx and get Jerome rezoning achieved. Thank you. I think she covered everything. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> thank you, Council Member Salamanca. <laughs> thank you to my colleagues. Uh, literally, she covered everything. But look, we, we're going to have, and I'll make it very brief, but basically, Jerome, uh, we're going to have a new look. Uh, we're going to be able to have uh, structural, uh, systemic, comprehensive change that is going to take place. One of my biggest pet peeves in my district was driving down Jerome Avenue and seeing that uh, we could do better. And now we're going to do better. Uh, we're literally getting the millions and millions of dollars that we truly deserve. And we're going to do this without gentrification taking place. The Furman Center did a tremendous report, I know, in our districts and found that we were not experiencing one of the only seven districts not experiencing gentrification. And we're going to make sure that that uh, continues uh, to, to, to be so. So with that, I, I close because literally uh, you did a fantastic job covering our team. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Next, the uh, council is going to be voting today on introduction number uh, 605A, which is sponsored by Council Member Steve Levin, which will require the NYPD to report on a quarterly basis the number of arrests and summonses issued for low-level marijuana possession disaggregated by the offense charged, race of the offender, gender of the offender, age of the offender, borough in which the offense took place, and the precinct, housing police service area, or transit bureau in which the offense uh, was uh, enforced. I want to invite uh, Steve, uh, but he is uh, not here, so uh, you'll be able to talk to him later about that. Um, but I support the bill wholeheartedly, and I support the legalization of marijuana. Um, uh, I also want to call up Councilmember Donovan Richards. We're going to vote on introduction uh, 262, sponsored by Councilmember Richards, amending local law 27 of 2015, which is going to require the Department of Education to report on various data regarding its provision of special education services to acquire a report to include the number of students in each school who have an individualized education program or as you hear in shorthand, an IEP. I want to call up uh, Donovan Richards to speak on this bill. 
I will be short. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this, this bill came out of uh, a visit to one of my local middle schools who I found had about 400 IEPs uh, just located in their building alone without the specific services, so counselors uh, to student ratios and the resources that they needed. And we found that uh, there were disparities, obviously, uh, across our borough of Queens when it came to where students are at. And this is not about um, pointing out or, 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 or making individuals who have IEPs feel like they should not be in a specific place or a specific building. But we do see that, obviously, there's a huge concentration, it seems like, of some in a few schools, uh, certainly located in particular communities that we wanted to ensure DOE took a look at and that the data was more transparent so that we can track down what are the resources being offered uh, to these particular schools. Um, so I want to thank the speaker. I want to thank the education chair, Mark Traeger, for this. Uh, this data is going to go a long way in ensuring that uh, we can ensure that these children are getting the just resources that they deserve and the services, more importantly, uh, in their schools. So thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, finally, we're going to vote uh, today to extend rent regulation laws in New York City, which is a very big deal. Uh, my legislation introduction 600A and resolution 188A would extend that a housing emergency exists in New York City requiring the extension of rent regulation laws. Rent regulation is the most critical tool we have for maintaining an affordable housing stock here in New York City. And uh, I'm proud that three years ago, before I was speaker, I carried these bills. Now as speaker, I'm carrying these bills. We have to strengthen the rent laws. The rent laws are up for renewal and potential expiration in June of 2019. I am committed to closing the gaping loopholes that exist that have allowed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of units to be lost since the early 1990s. We always talk here at the council about the need for more affordable housing. The easiest way to get more affordable housing is to preserve the affordable housing that we have currently. Two and a half million New Yorkers in our city of 8.6 million people rely upon rent regulation and rent control, and the number actually probably should be higher. So I am glad that we are voting on uh, these bills today, and I am happy to take any questions that you all have. Courtney. She did? I have a good working relationship with the governor, and I've been talking to him and the mayor and Speaker Heasty almost on a daily basis about the state budget and how it's going to impact uh, the city. So I am not going to engage in uh, the politics of this. We have plenty of time between now and the September primary. I want to get through the state budget, which hopefully will be adopted by April 1st. And then we'll have conversations. I, I will be politically involved. I will be politically active in the primary season, uh, not just on statewide races, but also on a variety of other races. So I look forward to having that conversation. But I think um, now is not the, the time for that. Um, I know Cynthia, I work with the governor. It's going to be a spirited race, and I will participate in that race at the right moment. Do you think she's an unqualified lesbian? No. What do you think of Kristen Quinn's comments with her about that? Anyone who knows Chris Quinn knows she gives you her unvarnished, <laughs> candid opinion uh, at any moment. And so uh, I've never asked for anyone to vote for me solely because I'm gay. Uh, voters make decisions based on issues based on um, a number of factors. Uh, so uh, of course Cynthia is uh, openly gay, I'm openly gay, Chris Quinn is openly gay, so is Jimmy Van Bramer. Um, that's no surprise openly and, uh, and uh, you know we're gonna continue to of course have conversations about LGBT issues and you know I, I wouldn't have put it that way but also you know, everyone who knows Chris knows she says exactly what she thinks, and, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. How important should someone's sexual orientation be versus someone's candidacy? And would it be exciting to see someone who's gay as head of the state? I mean, 
my sexual orientation, my being gay, um, I would say is not like my eye color because it is a central part of my identity. And I think it's really important when we see parental rejection still in New York City, when we see runaway homeless youth, a lot of whom are LGBT, when we see violence against the LGBT community, these issues still matter and it's really important for uh, openly LGBT elected officials and our allies to talk about these issues. So the fight isn't over for LGBT equality as we see every day with the assault coming from Washington DC and federal agencies. So I always welcome more um, gay people to run for office. I think it's an important thing. Uh, and I think it's always an opportunity to talk about these issues that may not otherwise get the attention that I think um, they need. Uh, but again, I don't think that it's an issue that voters are gonna vote on the basis of. I think voters are gonna vote on the basis of the affordability crisis that's plaguing New York City, uh, property taxes probably outside of New York City, economic development upstate. There are gonna be issues that really matter to the voters and each candidate will make their case and I'm gonna get involved, uh, but not at this moment. David. Yep. I got you an answer on that. So I, I looked it up after we spoke. So the, on the first part, I am very excited that we are uh, passing this increase because it's something that I openly talked about um, during the speaker's race. This isn't a surprise. A Gotham Gazette, I just read before I walked in here, talked about what each of us committed to in the speaker's race, and this was something that I talked about. Of course, we didn't talk about a specific dollar amount during the speaker's race, but we talked about, each one of us talked about adding staff for the legislative division. We've had 6,000 or more bills uh, introduced since the beginning of this session, and the, we don't have the staff capacity to continue to do that. We had a land use division that I believe was around 15 people, and the Department of City Planning's uh, staff is 330 people. We're increasing it to 21 people. We're creating a 20-person oversight and investigations unit to actually build upon the work we did in that first hearing, exposing the heat and hot water failures at NYCHA at the beginning of February. Uh, we put money aside for a Charter Revision Commission, as you all have covered, and we had a hearing on last Friday that Councilmember Cabrera, I think, chaired very, very well. We put money aside for outside counsel, where the law department is not going to defend us, we're going to defend ourselves. So the vast majority of the money, and each member is, uh, in January, we gave each member a, a mid-year modification bump of $20,000 uh, for their district offices. If that was annualized, it would be $40,000 to pay their staff more or to hire additional staff. We're increasing that to actually $60,000. One of the issues we have here at the council is we lose staff. The mayor's office and city agencies poach our staffers on a regular basis. We train them on the workings of government. They come to hearings and learn about the budget and legislative process, and then they get offered twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 more by another agency, and it makes it hard hard for us to do our jobs. So that's what the vast majority of the money goes to. The, the four-person increase in the Speaker's office, I, I honestly uh, wasn't sure what it related to until I spoke to the staff about it before I walked in here. I made a commitment to give the Progressive Caucus during the campaign a staff member that was not paid for by members, but paid for by the Speaker. I made a commitment to give the Women's Caucus a staff member during the campaign, not paid for by members or having member staff do that work. Um, I hired an extra body person. Um, so I have uh, two people instead of one um, who switch off because I work almost seven days a week and I don't want them to have to work seven days a week. So they divvy up those responsibilities. And uh, two of the special counsels for uh, the speaker who have worked in the legislative division, uh, one of them may be moving over to actually be considered part of the speaker's staff. I honestly think that uh, there also is some double counting going on in some ways. Some of Speaker Mark Viverito's staff uh, is still here um, as part of the speaker's office. Um, and uh, some of them may stay, some of them may not. Uh, so 
that number may not actually reach the number that was projected. The numbers that we detailed in the report that you all got today are projections. It doesn't mean we're going to hire up to that level in all the divisions, whether it be the Speaker's Office, the Legislative Division, the Land Use Division, Oversight and Investigations. That's a kind of a best estimate projection that we gave. If we don't hire up in those areas, of course, at the end of the year, the money will be returned um, to OMB and to the city. But we wanted to give you our best guess projection. I think it's been very clear over the last 12 weeks that it's a new day in the city council and we're really doing um, our job. We created a subcommittee on the capital plan chaired by Councilmember Gibson. Uh, we are increasing the land use capacity so that we can have more good outcomes like the Jerome Avenue rezoning. Um, we are in charge of looking at the city's budget, which is $88 billion, an increase of $2 billion from last year. And we honestly have been very understaffed in our finance division. If you look at the number of staff in our finance division, which was around, I think, 40 people, compared to what OMB has, they bring 40 people just to our hearing. So we needed to hire more staff to do that work. If you look at our legislative division, the number of bills, um, and of course it's every member's prerogative to ask bills to be drafted, but the number of bills that are asked to be drafted by our legislative division is so overwhelming to them right now. They are spending enormous amount of time drafting bills. This is about increasing capacity so we can do more work on legislation. You're gonna see more hearings than I think you've seen in the past. You're seeing more uh, work on uh, the budget through our subcommittee on capital. You're going to see more proactive land use work. I think Councilmember Salamanca and the council members who worked on Jerome could tell you that there's more that we could do in the land use process. And we're going to have a fully operational oversight and investigations unit that are going to do both short-term investigations and long-term investigations to fulfill our role of critical oversight. So I honestly, I'm really proud of us because um, this is, again, us taking back our power, us um, really saying we believe in the body, we believe in our charter mandated authority, we think that the staff here does a good job and can do a better job. Some of the staff here, even on the central staff, deserve um, a pay increase. Uh, not a huge pay increase, but a nominal pay increase so that we can keep their talent here. They have institutional knowledge. We go out and we talk about the importance of paying people a living wage in, here in New York City. We also want to treat the staff here well. So that's part of the budget. There's nothing in this budget that I'm uncomfortable with. I really think that this is us doing our job, and I'm really proud of the council um, saying we believe in our charter mandated authority and we're going to staff up in an appropriate way to be able to do it. And if, again, if you look at $17 million, the, the budget's going up, I think, to 81 million approximately. It was 64 million before, so it's a $17 million increase. If you look at the headcount in the mayor's office or the amount of money they spend, if you look at almost any city agency, we are less than most city agencies and our job is to oversee those agencies. Our job is to write oversight on those agencies. So we need to be fully staffed uh, to do that. And $17 million out of an $88 billion budget, which we have oversight over, is not a lot of money. And there's not, um, and, and part of the reason, again, why it's so big is put in money for a charter revision commission, almost $2 million. We put in money for a new uh, unit for oversight and investigations, which is very important to this body. We're setting aside money for having outside counsel where the law department says we can't file amicus briefs on behalf of the city council, which is crazy, and they won't defend us. We need to hire lawyers to do that. Everything in the budget, I think, is very defensible, and uh, I'm glad we're doing it. Jeff. As I read in Sanders' article, it sounds like the mayor doesn't really have oversight over the city council budget. I mean, you can set your own. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Than Well, I mean, that would be irresponsible if we did that, and we're not looking to be irresponsible. I mean, we literally, we spent, from when I was elected speaker on January 3rd, 
I asked the staff and the division heads to go around and detail exactly what their needs were, division by division. What are the needs? Why are those your needs? What are you going to be able to do with that money? What are the council members' needs for their districts? Um, and that's how we came up with this number. We didn't pull it out of the sky. It was actually a real collaborative process and an internal way um, in the body. The city charter says that the city council gets to set its own budget without outside interference, which I think is a good thing. And it's why I've also talked about independent budgeting that could potentially be looked at as part of a charter revision commission. So borough presidents could potentially have that. The public advocate and controller could have that. Community boards could have that. The conflict of interest board could have that. The independent budget office has it. That's set by the city charter. The city council has it. That's set by the city charter. Other independent branches of government should have that. It shouldn't be on the political whims of a speaker or a mayor on what other branches of government are able to do through their own budget. Uh, Rich. We're going to hold them accountable. I mean, I think you've seen that. I mean, we're spending almost uh, $2 million on creating a brand new unit on oversight and investigations, which is to have oversight and investigations on mayoral agencies. So uh, we're putting aside money for an independent charter revision commission. Uh, we're putting aside money to defend ourselves from the law department not defending us. So a big chunk of the money, I think, goes towards us um, of course, showing our independence and having the appropriate amount of oversight over mayoral agencies. Yeah. Rich. So the, the bill that requires detailed reporting on marijuana arrests, what, is, what does that say about what the police department is doing now, what, what they're presenting to you as the picture? Uh, do you have doubts about that picture, or is this, does this imply that there are doubts? Well, I'd be happy to, of course, let uh, Chair Richards, who chaired a hearing on this very topic, um, and uh, has spoken a lot about this, but um, I have concerns about the um, numbers that we see related to enforcement in New York City around marijuana arrests, the disproportionate impact and the number of arrests we see on communities of color, especially young men of color, which um, we know that uh, people of all races and ethnicities um, smoke marijuana in New York City. And so why is over 80% of the enforcement being done on black and Latino communities? So for us to be able to have that conversation in a specific and granular way, we need to have the numbers. You know, one of the reasons why I believe uh, we saw a significant um, diminishment of the use of stop and frisk was because the city council did reporting bills to try to understand the impact of stop and frisk and who was being targeted and who was being stopped. I think similarly, we know there's a high level of marijuana arrests in New York City, and we want to understand precinct by precinct, uh, block by block, race, gender, age, who, who actually is being impacted by this, and do we think it's actually being done in a fair way or in an uneven enforcement way, which is hurting communities of color. But I want Chair Richards to be able to speak as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, uh, I mean, most of you saw the data. Um, and the police department certainly spoke of 911 and 311 data, uh, which we think there's no correlation, correlation between uh, even that data and, and how they're doing enforcement. Right now, it's just the wild, wild west of enforcement. And it's whoever chooses to enforce in specific communities choosing who to enforce it and by. Um, so this bill is very important in driving that data, as he said, on just as we saw with stop and frisk. And there's a clear bias, and we want it to go up, up in smoke. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, uh, so yesterday your staff was not able to tell me uh, what the ratio of paid interns to unpaid interns at the city council is. Uh, all I could find online were listings for unpaid interns. Uh, does the new council budget uh, make all those, pay, those positions paid, or is, should the council not take its own progressive medicine when it comes to interns? 
It sounds like there's a little bit of uh, bias in that question on, on, on what you believe. But, you know, I, um, Will, the honest answer is uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what the ratio is. I can try to find that out for you. We'll get you that data. You deserve that data, and we should provide it. We need to be transparent on this. Um, there are both unpaid internships and paid internships. Um, again, it comes down to a level of resources, and we as a body um, in the past, the speaker has not told individual council members uh, what they need to pay their staff. Um, the, the speakers kind of stayed out of uh, and giving a level of autonomy to individual members across the city on how they handle their own staff and how they handle their own um, internships. Um, so um, I haven't thought enough about it. I'm happy to get back to you with the data and we can have a, another. Can we add, can I add something? Speaker? Sure, go ahead. Because sometimes we get contacted by colleges, you know, some of their students need internships, and so we take those individuals based on college credits as well. So I mean, I'm not, I'm opposed, not opposed to, just to I'm that. not opposed to paying yeah. uh, interns, but I, I need to get more information, yeah. and I'm, I'm happy to get back to you on it. Uh, ben? Sure. Yep. Haven't crafted that yet. The second part of the press conference today, I'm not sure if you saw his comments, but he said, I blame the politicians, I blame the city council, I blame the state assembly, I blame the state senate. Um, and both the mayor's office are also pointing out that, you know, Councilmember Torres had oversight of public housing for the last four years and, and wasn't, you know, talking like he's talking now. So where do you feel like the council's responsibility and the governor's responsibility for next year falls? Uh, someone uh, <laughs> leaned on that. Very uh, That was, uh, I think Laura was telling us to end the press conference. Um, uh, so on NYCHA, so I'll tell you exactly um, what, what I believe the, the ask and the path forward should be on NYCHA. I believe that we should have design build authority, of course, which will save us time and money and making some of the permanent repairs that are needed. That's number one. Number two, I would be open to an emergency declaration if it was tailored in a narrow way. And that narrow way is, and we've been trying to get information on this for quite a while and we're still trying, but I would say this, you could narrow it, you could tailor it uh, narrowly to focus on the waiving of procurement rules. If there are additional procurement rules that would still exist, even if we got design build authority, that would help us save additional time. The governor could give us an emergency declaration just on procurement to again expedite the clock. The money that was put in the 2015 state budget for NYCHA should be released. And if the governor wants a state agency to have some oversight on how that money gets spent and which projects are identified, back when uh, the previous money was given by the state, some of it went to roofs which was a good thing. We need roofs uh, to be fixed because there are mold issues if you don't fix the roofs. Um, and we need, so releasing that money, which is uh, $200 million, and then um, getting new money. The assembly put in $200 million in its one house budget. Last, not this past weekend, oh yeah, this past weekend the governor called for $250 million. Um, and the mayor put in the plenary budget uh, $200 million plus $13 million that he announced when the bomb cyclone happened. So that would be about somewhere between 600 million to 650 million of new monies that we would have for NYCHA um, to be able to do some of these emergency repairs. Um, that's what I think that we should do immediately. And that's where I think we could have the biggest impact. On what the governor said, you know, the governor knows how I feel. I, I want everyone to support NYCHA. Uh, we saw actually very good news today. It hasn't been voted on yet. It might be voted on tonight, the federal budget, where actually there's going to be an increase. I saw the Citizens Budget Commission uh, put out this morning on HUD funds for capital for NYCHA, an increase. I mean, I'm like kind of shocked that there may be an increase in federal funds, capital funds for NYCHA. That's a great thing. And we didn't see any loss in operating funds. So the federal government, I'm shocked to say, may be increasing funds for NYCHA. That's good. The state should do the same thing. The city should do the same thing. We actually haven't had a, been able to have a conversation yet as a conference 
and as a budget negotiating team, we'll have the conversation on if the council should push for, push for even more money than $200 million in capital funds. Um, I'm think, I think there are some people that are gonna wanna push for that, but we still have to have that conversation uh, as a body. And then, um, you know, I just want us to help folks. You know, I, I understand that the mayor and governor are not getting along well. I'm trying to work with both of them on the merits. So if I agree with the mayor on an issue that the body thinks is important, we'll work with him. If we agree with the governor on something, I'm gonna work with him. I'm really doing it on a case-by-case, merit-based thing. I'm not letting politics get in this. And um, a person that I talk to every day, multiple times a day is Speaker Hasty, who um, really is looking out for the city of New York um, and who has been wanting to understand what our needs are as a body. Um, even before we put our preliminary budget response out, he wants to know what's important to us in the state budget. So I've been working with him. He called me twice this morning. I spoke to him three times yesterday. I'm in regular communication with him. I mean, so if a private company can do it in a, in a good way, I guess I'd be open to it. But um, what I understand from what I saw reported in the press, he thinks that the city council and the residents of NYCHA should pick a contractor. I don't know anyone here who has the expertise to pick a contractor. Don't want to. I mean, I, I, we, I don't have that expertise. I don't know if the staff here has the expertise to pick a contractor. Maybe there's a city agency that has, has that expertise. Maybe there's a state agency that has that expertise. Um, I'm, I just want to get the repairs done. And I'm not sure putting it for the city council to pick a contractor is going to get the repairs done. I'm going to work with the governor on getting more money, on getting the money released, on getting design build authority, on waiving further procurement rules. I'm going to work with the mayor on ensuring that the staff at NYCHA is doing its job and that there is not further mismanagement and that we put even more money in the uh, adopted budget this year on NYCHA. I'm going to work with both of them. All of us just want to get results for the residents of NYCHA. That is what the goal is. Aaron. And that's the last question. Jen's going to kill me. Sorry, Jen. Let's see what's in the state budget. I mean, I want more money for NYCHA. I want more money from the federal government, the state government, and a municipal government for NYCHA. I'm gonna work with the governor. The governor has, of course, an important role to play in the budget dollars that our city receives. I'm gonna work with the mayor. We are the municipal legislature that works with him as part of government. I'm gonna work with both of them. So um, if, if this process, at the end of the day, uh, gets us over $600 million mm -hmm. in the state and city budget uh, for public housing residents, then, and that's not even counting the federal money, which I saw might be an additional $160 million in capital funds. That could be over $750 million in a few months of us all um, going through this roller coaster together. Mm -hmm. It may shake out in a good way at the end. We're going to continue to advocate for more money. I will work with both of them. We want results for NYCHA. Thank you very much.